Circle of Hope Network, doing life and being church together. So good afternoon, everyone. The reason I want to talk about Roots of Wholeness is, of course, I'm with the, um, this is a health ministry section. What I'm realizing the more and more that I travel is that there is a great need, thank you, there's a great need of prerequisites before people can experience the wholeness that God wants them to experience. So what do I mean by that? You can look at a cigarette pack today and um, on the cigarette pack you'll see a picture of a lung that's decomposing. And you think just because people can see that then nobody's going to smoke, right? But people just keep on smoking, right? And so we can see that it's more than just uh, facts. There's a lot more that needs to happen in the emotions, things that needs to happen in the mind and decisions before people can experience what is called whole, wholeness. So we're going to talk about proper way of thinking. Uh, we're going to talk about emotions. And why is this important? This is important because our ability to go out and make disciples is linked very closely with the healing that God gives to us. Are you with me? So some of you may think, oh, no, no, I just need to go out and make disciples. Making disciples is awesome, but unless we find, we start thinking right and have right roots, we will not be able to make disciples effectively. So I rent a little property in, uh, in Ontario. We rent, it's a one acre of land, a little bungalow. And uh, about a year ago, I got into my, my car and it started acting up a little bit we were driving on the the highway and it felt like if the car was pulling a little bit just a little bit of tug and you're driving a hundred kilometers and it's just pulling and that's not normal and so it's my wife's car so she told me about it i tried it and it was true and then because we don't have much money so we pray so we pray about it and we say god you know just just take care of this thing some things you need to pray about and just leave it in God's hands. Other things you need to pray and take to the mechanic, you know, but I, I just kept praying and, and, and the things got worse. Finally, um, it got to the point where it was really troublesome. And so I brought it to the mechanic. Mechanic looked all over the place, couldn't find what was wrong with the car. Finally, he decided to do something. He went into the motor. For those of you who know the motor a little bit, the side, he opened the side of the motor to the timing belt. And there, sorry for the gross depiction, but the head of a mouse fell, fell off. So a mouse got into the timing belt, right? So he came and told me, he found a discovery, and then he told me, it's gonna cost you $785. <laughs> I'm gonna to talk to you about emotions, emotions this afternoon. I, I, I'm telling you, the emotions was you can imagine $700 for a little mouse that went into the timing belt. I mean, I can go to Florida for $700, not quite, but almost. So I gave the emotions to the Lord. I said, Lord, I don't know what to do. I don't have the money. I told the mechanic, just swipe the credit card and fix the, ca fix the car and let's go. About uh, two months about a month after, I had to go to a funeral, so I jumped into the car, and I start, and the car wouldn't start. Same car. So I'm saying, what is this? It's not working. And so I called CAA, towed it to the mechanic, because I boosted it, nothing was happening. Looks, can't find what's wrong with it. Opens up the motor. Minnie Mouse falls out. 680-some dollars, right? Do you feel my pain? <laughs> and I'm thinking, Lord, what is this? I mean, what kind of lesson are, we, are, are you trying to teach me? Mouse in the timing belt again, fixed it, swiped the credit card, and we went. Just before Christmas, the snow had fallen, and I got into my car, the different car now, to start it, and it wouldn't start. And I stepped out. Now, 
Trust me, I'm putting traps everywhere, poisons, you name it, right? I'm even praying. So I step out and I look at the snow and I see tracks of mouse all over the car, right? All around the car. And it's not starting. The emotions, right? What do you do with your emotions? What do you do with your emotions, right? Now, I'm talking to you about mice. It could be anything. It could be spouse. It could be kids. It could be pressure at work. Some of us experience a lot of emotions in ministry. Church gives us a lot of emotional roller coaster. Many of you maybe have decided, you know what? I can't handle this thing. I just quit. And I'm just going to be a faithful seven-day tithe, paying, returning church member. But I can't handle the politics, emotions. I had to go to Ottawa that weekend, so I put it in God's hands. I came back, tried to start the car early in the morning. Try, try, try. Nothing was working. Finally, you know, we have worship with our kids before I go to work. And something was telling me, you know, Jonathan, you should just go and have worship with the family. And I'm saying, no, Lord, I need to get this thing started. This thing is not working. Jonathan, just go and have worship. You have to make a decision. So I made a decision. Okay, Lord, I'm going to leave this into your hands. So I went in. I told my, the kids, I told my wife, the car's not working and so forth. Of course, my wife was not so happy. But we knelt down in a circle and we prayed. And this is the essence of the prayer. The essence was this, Lord, it's your car. It's your money, and it's your mouse. <laughs> they all belong to you. We leave it in your hands. We had worship. We prayed. I got out. I started the car. The car started. You know, I've been driving the car for seven months. It hasn't given me any issues since then, you know? The funny thing is I saw tracks going to the car, but no tracks leaving the car. I don't know where that mouse, it might still be in there, but the bottom line is the Lord has it maybe quarantined somewhere. Um, talking about emotions this morning, this afternoon, sorry. I want to deal with some questions. What should I do with my feelings, my emotions, my craving, my passions, my fears? I believe that my feelings are a gift from God to help me enjoy life, but why do they bring me so much disorder and confusion in my life? Is there such thing as bad emotions? And if so, do they define who I am? What happens when my feeling and my emotions take over my life? And so I just want to say I'm not a professional, psychologist, counselor, whatever. All I'm going to share with you this afternoon is my journey. And uh, I come from a dysfunctional family. My parents were divorced. There's a lot of issues that happened when we were kids. The more I traveled, the more I realized... All families are dysfunctional to a certain degree or other, but some are more than others. And when I look at my life, and even my wife and I talk often, and she will often say, Jonathan, why are you not like your other siblings? And I don't think it's because I'm better. I don't think it's because I'm smarter or more spiritual. I just believe that God was able to give, bring healing, emotional healing in my life. And this is extremely important if we are to be effective soul winners for Christ. And throughout the week, we're going to see how this proper way of thinking, dealing with the roots of wholeness, helps us to be effective soul winners for Christ. I do also want to say, though, I believe in chemical imbalance. I mean, I have a sibling. I have close family members that are struggling with chemical imbalance. So I'm not saying that uh, everything there's still sometimes room for medication, but I do believe that a lot of what we experience, we with the power of God can experience change. Some of the things we experience uh, mark us very lightly like a little mouse. Some things mark us much deeper like hurts that we have experienced in our past. And um, so what do we handle? How do we handle these things is what we're going to talk about today. So Jesus and my crazy feelings, spiritual foundations for good emotional health. The first thing I want to start with is a Bible verse. It's Galatians 5, 22, 23. It says, but the fruit of the spirit is what? Love. Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such there is no law. And so when we're talking about emotional health, foundations for emotional health, we can see here things in the fruit of the spirit that are linked with emotions. Can you see some in there? What would you say are linked with your emotions? 
Which one? Self-control, Self definitely. Is there another one? Joy. Yeah, joy. Another one you can see? Love. That has some emotion in there. A lot, you know, we could almost tie emotions to most of them, gentleness. And so for us to be able to experience good emotional health, we need what? The Holy Spirit, amen? So 1 Corinthians 3.16 says, Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? So we want God's Spirit to dwell in us. But where does the Spirit of God dwell in us? Is it in our hand, in our foot? I mean, how, does, how can we experience good emotional health? It says the brain nerves, Testimonies Volume 3 says, The brain nerves which communicate with the entire system are the only medium through which heaven can communicate to man and affect his or her in most life. So what happens is that it's my mind the brain nerves, that's where the Holy Spirit communicates with me. That's where I can find that joy, peace, self-control. It all happens up here, okay? Proverbs 23 verse 7 says, For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. So just to, I'm trying to share with you my journey. I'm not perfect, but I can just share with you some of the emotional healing that God has brought in my life. What is my background? My background is literature evangelism. So basically, I've knocked at thousands and thousands of doors. In the old days, they used to call them cold porters, right? So when you go knocking at doors, you never have somebody that says, hey, I've been waiting for you all my life. Come on in. You know, you don't have that kind of reaction. I mean, people are nice and polite, but most of the time is I'm not interested. It can be an emotional roller coaster. You need to have emotional stability to be able to do that kind of work, right? So I decided to go back hindsight and said, how did I experience some of the healing in my life? And what are the biblical principles that help? The first one I found, point to consider, is that there is a link between my thoughts and my character. Can you see that from the verse there? As he thinks in his heart, so is he. Another verse is Proverbs 4.23. It says, above all else, guard your heart, for out of it spring the issues of life. Two things I discovered. First thing is that a heart must refer to the mind and not the blood organ, which is a combination of your thoughts and your feelings. And number two, if it tells me that I should guard my heart, that means that insinuates a level of what? Of control, of control. There's some people that says, well, this is who I am. This is what I experience, this is what I feel. I'm not gonna talk about this today, but I think you're gonna see it. There's a big issue out there called LGBTQ and there's all these other letters afterwards. And what I'm talking today has a lot to do with that because this is something that they experience, this is something that they feel, and therefore this is something, who, this is who they are, right? I'm, and, and, and we have it more in a lesser degree, we can say, well, I'm Irish, or I'm West Indian. I mean, that's who I am, right? Is it really who you are? So it says here, guard your heart, for out of it spring the issues of life. So putting in a graph, trying to see how all of this comes together. Some of you probably know this concept, but it's good to be reviewed. You have your thoughts and your feelings, right? And your thoughts and your feelings combined produces your words and your actions. The more you repeat your words and your actions, that develops your habits. You put all your habits together, that's your character, and your character determines what? Your destiny, right? So many people, when they want to change, they focus on their habits or they focus on their words and their actions. But if you really want to change, what should you focus on? Your thoughts and your feelings, right? But then the question is, I think, therefore I am, or I feel, therefore I am. This is very important. It's a little bit of philosophy, but we're getting there. Just hang in there with me, okay? What do I identify more with? Is it my thoughts or is it my feelings? What has the greatest control in my life? You know, some people will say, Jonathan, you need to focus on your thoughts. And I would agree with you, because your thoughts, if you think right, eventually your emotions line up with your thoughts. But you know, there are people out there that have some very, very crazy thoughts. Are you with me? So thoughts may not always be right, Neither emo feelings would be right. So you have emotional distress on one end and you have bondage to fears and anxieties on another end. 
Hebrews chapter 4, 12 says, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any two double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing soul and spirit, joint and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. So this point I was able to consider is that God's word, for God's word to judge our thoughts and motives, it must be above my thoughts and my emotions. Are you with me? This is very important because I feel a certain way or I think a certain way. But if God's word says something different that I think, or if God's word says something different than I feel, God's word judges me, therefore God's word has to be above me. So what would it look like? Jesus and his word is the top. After that comes my thoughts, which should align themselves to his word, and after that comes my feelings, which should align themselves to my thoughts, which should align themselves to his word. When I was 16 years old, this is something very small, but it's something that really changed my life. I had a project, I don't, it was a science project, I think it was, I don't remember exactly what it was, but I do remember I had done everything I could, it was about midnight or one in the morning, and I was exhausted, I had to go to bed, because I couldn't think right, but I, I just felt that I, I hadn't done, I wasn't going to get the best grade, right? When I was 16, a lot had happened in my life. My parents got divorced. Uh, a lot of things were happening. I had done the best I could, right? But even sometimes your best is not enough, right? And I knew it. And so I went to bed and I'm laying down and I'm laying down on my bed and I just sense these feelings of anxiety and you're gonna fail and, and, and everything's not gonna work out. Just overwhelms. Now some of you have never experienced stress or anxiety, but some of you have, and you know what I'm talking about. Well, you know, stress, but stress to the point where it's almost crippling. So I can't sleep. So I get up, I get, I get out of my bed, I kneel down, and I give it to the Lord, right? I give it to the Lord, and I say, Lord, you know, I've done everything I could. I give you these emotions that are overwhelming me, this of anxiety. I give you the thoughts that I'm going to fail and whatever. I'm just giving it to you and I crawl back into bed. I get back in bed, and just a few seconds afterwards, once again, those emotions just start taking over, and those thoughts of failure start taking over. I don't really know what to do, so I get out of my bed, I kneel, and I give it to God. I get back in my bed, again, those emotions of, of failure, and anxiety. I did that like five or six times. And I kept claiming the promises of God, saying, God, I've done everything I could. I surrender this to you. I claim your promises. I don't, I give it to you. I can't do anything. You know, the fifth or sixth time when I climb in my bed, I slept like a baby. A good baby, that is. If you have babies, you know. <laughs> I remember waking up the next day and thinking, wow. For me, that was like one of the most revolutionary thing ever. This was the revolutionary thing, is that with God's help, I have the power to control my thoughts and my feelings. You know, I didn't know that. And do you know that most people don't know that? Some people do know, okay, their thoughts they can control, but most young people, they think when a thought is presented, it's their thought. When an emotion takes over them, it's their emotion. It's part of who they are, hence LGBTQ. And so when the word of God says something and they're saying, whoa, 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 this is what I feel, this is who I am, and the word of God is completely irrelevant because this is what I'm experiencing. The word of God is, this all over, is, is completely outside the realm of my reality. Are you with me? And so they have to make a choice. They have to choose whether I'm going to believe the word of God, which is com some, something completely abstract, or if I'm going to tie and hold on to my reality, which is my thoughts and my feelings. But I began to realize, no, there's actually a point when where a thought is being introduced or an emotion is being introduced, there's a split second where with God's help, I can actually choose to make that emotion mine, make that thought mine or not. Revolutionary concept for me. And this changed my life. 
Second Peter 1, 4 says, by which have been given to us exceeding great and precious promises. And so what I did those five, six times is I claimed the promises of God, right? That through these, you may be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So how do I escape the corruption that is in the world through lust? Is through partaking of the divine nature. How do I partake of the divine nature? By claiming God's promises, which is against the reality of my thoughts and my feelings at times. Second Peter 1, 4 says, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So with God's spirit and the claiming of his word, I found out that I could control my thoughts, which in turn would affect my feelings. Testimony volume five says this, even your thoughts must be brought into subjection to the will of God and your feelings under the control of reason and religion. Most people say, well, I can't, ex I can't help feeling what I feel. Do you know that you feel what you feel because you think what you think? But this is the way I feel. You feel that way because you think that way. And if you ask God to help you to stop thinking a certain way and start thinking a better way, you will start noticing that your emotions will start lining themselves up. Your imagination was not given to you to be allowed to run riot and have its own way without any effort at restraint or discipline. If the thoughts are wrong, the feelings will be wrong. And the thoughts and feelings combined make up, remember, the moral character. That's my family. My wife, her name's Denisa. I have a boy. I can't deny he's mine. <laughs> Poor boy. And my girl. This is my wife, Denisa, right? We've been married for, I think, don't tell her, I think. <laughs> it's going to be 16 years now, right? And, you know, to be honest, not that I haven't been honest with you all this time, but to be very honest, I'm so happily married. You know, and I'm telling you, I didn't want to get married because my parents got divorced and I thought, you know, happy marriages, they don't really exist out there because, you, you know, you see a lot of stuff. But God has blessed me with a wonderful, wonderful wife. Right? wife. But I want to tell you my life before Denisa. Before Denisa, there was a young lady that I greatly loved, right? And it wasn't her, right? Since the age of, I don't know, 10, 11, and I just knew this was the girl that I was going to marry, right? I loved her. She loved me. Um, we did ministry together. We grew up in the same church. Um, I just, for me, I really, really loved this girl. And she was very beautiful on the inside, on the outside. Um, but then I went to college. And when I'm in college, I just felt the impression, I did some reading, and I felt the impression that I should put relationships on, on the back burner. Um, for you who are in relationships, you know relationships take, relationships take a lot of time, take a lot of money, take a lot of energy. And, um, you know, I, I was just discovering some of the principles, even from the spirit of prophecy. And, and that is, you know, and I'm not saying, you know, this is for everybody. I'm just saying this is what I was convicted to do, right? So I went to this young lady and I told her, listen, you know, this is my conviction. I feel that I need to focus, and I was, you know, I'm studying for the ministry, and I'm, I, I say, I, I feel I need to focus on the calling first, the training to have the calling God has on my life. And, uh, you know, I, I hope, you know, you'd be willing to wait for me, uh, but if you're not willing to wait for me, I fully understand. Now, I fully expected her to wait for me because, I mean, what's the better option out there? <laughs> but she didn't wait for me. <laughs> and you know, what made it worse is she didn't wait for me. Um, and she, she, she started going out with a, a very good friend of mine who was, you know, maybe taller, stronger, I don't know, maybe more handsome, I don't know. When I saw that, it really hurt, right? It hurt. Um, I'm trying to do God's will, what, trying to follow God's convictions. I fully believe that God would keep this young lady from me. And she just, yeah, she doesn't get the picture. She, maybe she's not listening to God. I don't know. <laughs>
To make it worse, he was one of my best friends. And so when they decided to get married, I had to be part of the wedding party. <laughs> and so if you watch the videos, I'm trying to look really happy for them. <laughs> But here you have the love of your life, you know, going and marrying somebody else, you know. And I'm trying to smile as much as I could. But I, it was tough. It was tough. The day I found out, that she was going out with this guy. You know what, I, I, I purpose in my heart, you know what? I choose to love still. I'm gonna treat them with kindness and, 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 and gentleness. The emotions are not there, right? But the word of God says love, and I'm gonna love them. I'm gonna love them, I'm gonna, Lord, I make that choice and I claim your promises. I will be their friend. If they don't want to be my friend, that's okay. I will be their friends, hence, They couldn't tell there was any issue between me and them, which is why they asked me to be in the wedding party, right? And to be one of the, the best men, one of the best men there. Do you know that for two years after that, we, we did things together, they didn't live very far from us. Every time I would see them, every time I would talk to them, there'd be so much pain in here, right? So much pain. And I remember about two years later, I called their house and... I wanted to talk to him. She answered. So we, ju we just talked about, I don't, I don't remember what it was. I do remember that when I hung up, I felt as if God was saying, see? I said, see what? He said, see, nothing. I said, nothing. You're right. For the first time after two years, the pain was gone, completely gone. I had made a decision not to listen to my reality but to listen to the word of God, to claim the promises of God's word. And yeah, God can do whatever he wants. It took two years before the pain was gone, but it left eventually. And what that taught me, it, it taught me that God's word is above my thoughts and my thoughts needs to be above my emotions. And so I need to make the decision based on God's word, regardless of crazy thoughts I may have, regardless of the emotions I may be experiencing, I chose to love. I chose to be kind and courteous. And you know, God honored that. And so what happened is, eventually, throughout the months, as I kept claiming the promises of God, the emotions lined up with the decisions that I had made, the decisions that I had made. This is extremely important principle. You know, I go knocking on doors. I don't wake up in the morning thinking, yes, I'm going to go get rejected today. <laughs> Nobody thinks that way, right? But I'm telling you, after you leave a door and somebody gives you a hug and says, you know what, thank you for coming to my house. You know, the, the, you think, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life, right? But the only reason you were able to go out there is you didn't listen to your emotions. You didn't even listen to all the reasoning of why you shouldn't do this. You just followed the call that God had placed on your life. There are certain calls that God has placed on your life. Service in your local church is one of them. Many individuals quit because they can't handle the politics, because they have not understood this concept of thoughts and emotions. They just say, you know what, there's, uh, there's, there's, this is the line, and I have just enough, and that's it. I quit. Can't handle anymore. This, th you've gone too far. I understand there's such thing as abuse, and you have to be careful. We're going to talk about that a little bit later in the week. But what you're going to realize is that even tomorrow, we're going to talk about how God uses even conflict Conflict is one of the most powerful ways to be able to reach individuals for the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's very interesting. Most of us avoid conflict. I'm not saying you need to get into conflict, but I'm just saying most of us avoid stuff not realizing that's one of the most powerful ways to witness for Christ in the church and outside the church. SDA 146 says, The adversary of soul, Satan, is not permitted to read the thoughts of men but he is a keen observer and he marks the words and actions. So I don't know if you know, Satan can't read your thoughts. 
okay? But we know that your thoughts and your feelings combined produces your words and actions, right? So he can't read the thoughts and the feelings, but he can read your words and your actions. So what he's doing, he looks very carefully at your words and your actions. He marks them and skillfully adapts his temptations accordingly. If all would labor to repress sinful thoughts and feeling, giving them no expression in words or acts, Satan would be what? Defeated, for he would not know how to prepare his precious temptations to meet their cases. And so what happened is before, whenever a temptation, uh, a thought came or an emotion came, I just thought it or I just felt it because it's part of who I am. But after 16, I began to realize, no, this is an emotion that I would love to take part in, whether it's a lustful or bitterness or whatever. But this will not define me. I can choose not to accept this emotion. This thought, this person really did me wrong. Man, I can choose to accept it and make it part of me or I can reject it. And so the more that you claim God's promises and you put this block for your emotions and thoughts, the more Satan is looking at you and he doesn't know what to do. Because every time he gave you a thought, it went right in. Every time he proposed an emotion, it went right in. And now it's not working anymore. So he's confused. He doesn't know what to do. That's how we can defeat Satan. And of course, it's the word of God through the power of the Holy Spirit and spending time in prayer that changes our thoughts. You know, the Bible says, sanctify them through thy truth, thy what? Thy what? Word is truth. Sanctify means to set apart for a holy purpose, right? So what happens is the more we spend time in God's word, the more our thoughts are set aside for holy. So our thoughts are more holy. The more that our thoughts are holy, the more our emotions line up and are holy too. And therefore, the words and the actions that spill out of us are more godly, better habits, godly character, and our destiny is heaven by God's grace. Review and Herald, 1885, says, when we decide that as Christians we are not required to restrain our thoughts and feelings, we are brought under the influence of evil angels and invite their presence and their control. Can you see how these are prerequisites to wholeness? Yeah, we want to be healthy. Good emotional health, good physical health, you know, as Seventh-day Adventists, we experience as a whole better health than the average individual out there. But remember, what we're talking about is not just so I can be healthier. These are prerequisites to us being effective discipleship makers. Amen? So you want emotional healing? We talked about John 17, 17. It says, by the study, by study, contemplation, and prayer... God's people will be elevated above common earthly, notice here, thoughts and feelings, and will be brought into harmony with Christ and his great work of cleansing the sanctuary. This is what we're, is happening right now. Jesus is in the most holy place. There's, there's a work that is happening right now, and through the study of God's word, meditation on what we read, and prayer, we can, with God's word, have our thoughts and our feelings sanctified, meaning elevated above the common and the earthly. And of course, you have to start by, and I have to start by, stop making excuses. Well, this is who I am. Well, it's because of my dad. Well, my mom, she's the, well, because I'm Irish. I'm just saying, or whatever. This, we have to make a decision and say, you know what? This is how I am, yes. This is the way I was raised, yes. I didn't have the best upbringing. I had years of thinking wrong. But now that I understand, God is, will be my helper. He will help me. And not only that, I can now cooperate with Christ in his great work of cleansing the sanctuary. So some of the emotional healing that I experienced in my life, one was a study of God's word. There's no shortcut. You know, it's, you know, programs like Hope TV, 3ABN, those are good. But I don't think it ever fully replaces you spending quality time in God's Word on your own, right? Meditation, this is extremely important. Few people meditate. And when I say meditate, I'm not talking, hmm. I'm talking, you read God's Word, and then you 
quietly think and ask God's Holy Spirit to impress upon you the lesson from what you just read. You don't have to spend three hours. You can spend sometimes five minutes, 10 minutes, just thinking with the Holy Spirit on what you've just read. You'd be amazed on how the Holy Spirit, it's almost as if God at that time is when God can really speak to you. But most of us were so busy that we just read a little something, pray a little something, and bam, we're out the door. That's if we read and pray. Meditation. We want healing. I'm just saying, this is the way that God was able to bring some of the emotional healing that I desperately needed in my life. Prayer. Prayer specifically for the Holy Spirit. Another one is something called healthy mental boundaries. We kind of alluded it to it before, but I'm just being honest with you. This is something that has really helped me in my life. When I was a kid, we didn't have television until I was, I don't know, six or seven. And even then, my dad bought a black and white TV, one where you kind of had to put the antennas in and you had to have brother or sister hold it (laughs) so you could get, you know, don't move, you know, so you can get the channels. But dad wouldn't leave the TV out. He would actually hide the TV. You know, we're four kids at home. He would hide the TV because he knew he couldn't trust us. But whenever dad would leave and mom would leave, we would hunt all over the house to find that television, okay, as if it was like a drug. We were fortunate or unfortunate, I don't know, dad had a little diesel golf. So the nice thing about it, we could hear the car coming from very far away. And so what would happen is when we would hear it coming, quickly we would, you know, put the TV and we would wrap, and we had a cord in the back, you had to wrap that thing, put the antenna back, and then you could start sweeping, and I'll read my Bible. <laughs> and then we put it back exactly, and we looked like pure little angels. I don't know if my parents ever found out, you know? what we would do. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. Eventually, when my parents divorced and uh, we were, I guess, given more liberty, got a nice color TV. And I just, I watched a lot of television as a teenager, right? Some of you can sit in front of TV, watch something and walk out. I'm not that type of person, right? I just sit down and I watch and it seems like three hours go by and then what has happened? So that's one of the things that I decided, my wife and I, we said, you know what, when we get married, we can have a video player, but if we don't have cable or TV, that would be better, right? So what is some healthy mental boundaries? One of the healthy mental boundaries that I have made for myself is when I go, and I travel a lot, when I go to a hotel room, I just don't turn the television on, okay? Is it a sin to turn the television on? No. Is there a good program? Are there good programs on TV? Yes, I can have History Channel, Discovery. There's amazing programs. But I know myself, and I know that if I turn that on, six hours later, I'll still be watching. And and I have a lot of work to do. I can't sit and watch this stuff, right? So I made a healthy mental boundary for myself. Why am I telling you this? Prerequisites to good emotional health, which is prerequisites to effective soul winning, there are boundaries that only you can make. Your spouse can't make it and God Almighty will not do that for you. And what I have found traveling is that many individuals just expect the church, the pastor, the spouse, the parents to make that boundary for them. There are some healthy boundaries that only you can make. God will help you. You need to make that decision. So that, is there a sin to open the fridge at nine o'clock at night? No, I mean, there's nothing wrong with opening the door. Thou shalt not open the fridge at night. It's nowhere in the Bible or spirit prophecy. But you know, when you open that fridge at night, you do inventory, and next thing you know, you're eating ice cream or whatever, right? So you know you can't open that fridge. It's that simple. I have knocked at many doors in the South. Virginia, Texas, Florida, you know, many states. Do you know? that I cannot tell you one person that I have met who was racist? I'm sure I've met thousands of them. But I have never left a door saying, you know what, this guy is not interested because I'm a visible minority. Why? Because I made a mental check and says, you know what, I'm not gonna go there with my mind. Now if the guy starts yelling at me and whatever, yeah, that's fine. Why? Because some individuals, what they say, oh, 
They don't like me because I'm black or brown or whatever. This is why, no, 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 no. And then they start going down this path that God Almighty himself can't pull you out until you understand that that path is wrong thinking. Are you with me? And so I've had thousands of people reject me, but I have made a decision that I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt that they're just having a bad day. Not because I'm black or brown or whatever. They're just not interested and they have a right not to be. Healthy mental boundaries. Some of you have children. One of my greatest pet peeves is when a kid will ask mom or dad, mom, can I have it? No. Can I have it? No. Can I have it? No. Can I have it? Mom, please, no. Please, no. Please. Okay. What have you just taught your child? That if they go past 17 times, they'll get what they want, right? It is an important law of the mind, one which should not be overlooked, that when a desired object is so firmly denied as to remove all hope, the mind will soon cease to long for it and will be occupied in other pursuits. But as long as there is any hope of gaining the desired object, an effort will be made to obtain it. And so we can see that with children. It is the same with you and I. We need, with God's help, to develop healthy mental boundaries, meaning I do not move past this boundary, so help me God. Do you know that there will come a point, I'm just using the hotel example. When I go into a hotel now, I don't even look at the TV. Before it's like, ah, should I watch it, should I not? You know, it's not a sin, Lord. Can I just see what's on for our Hope Channel? Oh, there's no Hope Channel, that's true. Maybe Discovery. I walk in, I don't even look at it. Why? Because God has helped me with the boundary. Why am I giving you this example? I'm a sinner. Saved by grace, amen? Sinner, probably worse sinner than all of you. But what I'm trying to explain to you is that with God's grace, we need to cooperate with the grace of God. God's grace is powerful enough to be able to supply all our needs. But there's some things that Almighty God will not do for us. And some of us, we expect God to do that for us. And so it's 20 years, it's 50 years later, we still have the same bad temper, we still have the same, and we're wondering, God, why are you not taking this away from me? Why are you not helping me? My emotional healing, study of God's word, meditation, prayer, healthy mental boundaries. And the last one is a surrendered life focused on the love of God. You know, this has done more for me than what you can imagine. You know, many of us, we, un, we, don't, we don't fully understand this concept of total surrender to God. <laughs> Most of us, when we surrender to God, we expect God to do something for us. Meaning, I surrender, I surrender all, but you better provide for my bills and you better heal my wife from cancer. I surrender all, but Lord, I'm struggling with this and help my child to do this. All to Jesus. Of course. We want healing. We want financial security. But you know what true surrender is? Is Lord, I want you to protect my family. I don't want anybody to die. I want you to heal this dear person. I want you to provide financially and give me a job and whatever. But God, if you take away my home, my mortgage and my R-E-R-S-P, whatever, if my wife passes away and my kids turn from you, If I lose everything and I'm walking down the street with only the clothes on my back, it's okay, God. Just don't remove your presence from me. That is complete surrender. Of course God wants to take care of us. Of course we have the promises of God to claim. And of course, as we claim them, God answers. But the mindset should not be, I surrender, therefore you need to take care of me, God. God doesn't owe us anything. Total surrender means, God, everything I surrender to you even if you treat me like dirt, and even if you kill me, I'll still serve you because you are worthy. And then God can start doing amazing, great things in our lives. Total surrender to God's will. A surrendered life that has to be focused on the love of God. I came across this statement. Some of you may have read it before. It just really tickled my mind when I read it. You know, when, when uh, the Bible says that uh, Jesus was the lamb slain from the foundation of the earth, 
And that basically means that before they even created the world, they already had a plan in place. Uh, Jesus and the Father, right? And so when Adam and Eve sin, what happened is Jesus went into a meeting with God the Father. And you have billions of angels and other worlds that are outside and they're waiting to see what is going to happen with that meeting. Because everybody saw Adam and Eve's sin, right? And it says here, before the Father, he, Jesus, pleaded in the sinner's behalf, while the host of heaven awaited the result with an intensity of interest that words cannot express. This was fascinating to me because this is God. They already knew what they were going to do. They knew the plan. So they could have said, okay, Adam sinned? Yeah, Adam sinned. You know we expected this for a billion years. Yeah, we knew he was going to sin. Okay, so, we would, okay, so this is the plan. You're going to go and you're going to tell them this? No. There was a plan in place, but even though the plan is in place, there still needs to be a meeting with God. And God the Father and God the Son, they have this meeting. And everybody's waiting outside. And notice what it says. Long continued was that mysterious communion. You're thinking, why in heaven does it take so long? They already knew what they were going to do. The council of peace for the fallen, sons of man. It says the plan of salvation had been laid before the creation of the earth, for Christ is a land slain from the foundation of the world. Yet, it was a struggle, even with the king of the universe, to yield up his son to die for the guilty race. Can you believe that? You know what that gave me hope? I always saw God as, yes, a loving God, but kind of, he doesn't have emotions like I do. And that just hit me so hard because I began to realize, no, 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 God the Father and God the Son, they understand what I'm going through because they experience emotions to the depth of what I cannot even imagine. Here is God the Father and the Son. The plan is all laid. They've known this for millennia, what would happen. And yet when it happens, Jesus still has to plead. And God the Father is saying, yes, yes, I know we have to do this. I know we decided. I know this is the right thing to do. I know. But I just can't seem to let you go. I I just can't do it. And so I don't know if it was minutes or hours or days. <laughs> I think it's probably more like hours. God the Father struggles to give up his son. Friends, you have issues with your emotions. I have issues with emotions, anxieties, fears, passions, cravings. God understands what we're going through. God understands But I'm telling you one thing, even though God could have decided not to send Christ, he still sent him. Why? Because he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You know that God loves you. Whenever you're in doubt and you may think, you know, there's somebody, I don't know if God fully understands to the depths of his soul what I'm going through, he does, and even beyond. And the last question you may ask is, why can I trust Jesus above my thoughts and my feelings? You remember Matthew 27, Christ is on the cross, and he's saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Do you know that this is a prayer that God never answered? (laughs) God was completely silent. Sometimes you may feel that way when you pray, and it seems your prayer just hits the ceiling especially when we're praying for loved ones or sometimes that are sick or sometimes are children who have left the church and we agonize with God and we cry and we seem that God doesn't hear. Jesus knows what it feels like. What about his feelings? All his emotions told him to get off that cross. After all, God himself had forsaken him. What about his thoughts? The thoughts that kept being introduced by Satan was that his sacrifice was a complete waste. Satan was saying, listen, you have disciples who have seen you, who have walked with you, who have seen everything, your miracles. They don't believe. They forsook you. There's no hope for people living in 2019 who has never seen and and whatever. Forget it. Get off that cross. 
God had forsaken him. The closest friends had forsaken him. Every thought and every emotion told him that it's a waste. Get off the cross. In Desire of Ages, we are told he could not see beyond the portal of the tomb, but he stayed on the cross. He stayed on it still. Why? If Christ chose to die, rather than break his promise or word, I can also trust him and his word above my thoughts and my feelings. Friends, this is so important. This is what separates me from the average and you from the average, even Christian out there. It separates, we live in a world where Christianity is moved by their emotions, right? They even come to church to have an emotional experience. But what we're saying is, no, no, no. Sometimes the word of God says something and it resonates nothing in our emotions and nothing in our way of thinking. But if the word of God says it, if Christ says it, I can trust him. Why? Because for me, Every thought and every emotion that was placed or introduced to him told him otherwise. And he still decided, you know what? Even if I go to hell, fine. I'd rather go to hell for you than go to heaven without you. We can trust our Lord Jesus Christ. And so what I'm trying to encourage us today is to realize that I can guard my heart with the power of God. The word of God is above my thoughts and my feelings. That when I choose enough to obey God's word, claiming on his promises, my emotions eventually line up. The pain I experienced was two years. Other things in my life I'm still struggling with. But I still choose. I'm not going to listen to my emotions. And some people will say, well, John, that's such a hypocritical type lifestyle. I mean, will we ever feel like we will ever feel it? For some things in my life, I can say I feel it fully. Some things in my life, I don't feel it. But I'm not called to walk by feelings. I'm called to walk by faith. And I'm telling you one thing. When our Savior Jesus Christ returns and we're engulfed with the beauty of the scene and we go up to heaven and we see everything that God has prepared for us then you know what all the feelings and emotions that maybe we have lacked here will be well taken care of beyond what we can ever think or imagine and so my prayer is that we can experience the emotional healing that God has for us if there's a crowd this size I know there are people in here that have been abused, that have been hurt, that have gone through divorce, that have gone through so many things. And what we're going to see later on in the week is that if I can start thinking right, allowing God's grace to go deeper into my life, you will start seeing not only changes in your own life, but changes in your marriage, changing in your family, in your church ministry, and in discipleship for Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we're so grateful, Lord, for your holy word that teaches us biblical principles on how we can live for you. Father, there are some individuals here that have experienced deep hurt, emotional trauma. If we've just lived a little bit, we've experienced a lot of stuff. And not only that, because of her hereditary and some of us, because of cultivation, we've cultivated different habits. That now, Lord, when we're placed into certain situations and there's triggers, just all the emotions, the feelings, they just are wrong. Even the thoughts are twisted. But Father, I thank you that today you're teaching us that we can be partakers of your divine nature. So I invite your Holy Spirit to come to come into our hearts, to come into our minds. Help us to experience right thinking and right feeling. And I pray that you may recreate in us that clean heart, one that can align themselves with the working of your Holy Spirit, one that can think right, one that can have healthy emotions, that in turn we can turn around and be a powerful witness 
in saving souls for your kingdom. I ask and pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Circle of Hope Network, doing life and being church together.